like this um i started the little school okay uh i didn't start big people think i start big uh what happened was uh when master carlos moved to united states to open his school i was fortunate to be there and help them to to teach so i learned from the source you know so later on professor marcio professor uh, flavio they come up with the idea to become a franchise and I was the first one actually to embrace the idea of the franchise. And the reason that I embraced was because I was actually, I was not an employer because I didn't get paid, but, but I was one of the, the instructors over there. And that one helped me to understand that the system works really well, you know? So that that's was how I become big because I, I learned from the source, you know? And when, when was that then, Professor? So how many years ago? 10 years? 12 years? 2007. 2007 was the year that Gracie Barra uh, stopped to become association and become actually franchise. I was the number 0001 franchise, <laughs> zero, you know? <laughs> wow. But not, not by, because I was, it's just because I was the first one and I embraced the idea, you know? <laughs> And you, you were actually in the States player. before Master Carlos and, and Marcio, right? Yes. Um, I moved to the United States with a friend of mine. Uh, I have my neighbor that actually he does um, Kung Fu. And at the time I, I trained Jiu-Jitsu. And the idea was let's move to the United States. Let's fight the UFC, become rich, you know. <laughs> but even the people that actually fight the UFC at that time was not making any money. And then we moved, and I ended up, I did nothing related to martial arts. I was uh, working all kinds of jobs, valet parking, bouncer. And in my free time, I was uh, training, you know, competing. And my friend that came also, he, he started to deliver pizza, never actually get involved with the martial arts anymore, <laughs> you know. And life took us to a different direction. We're still good friends, so today he is like... A, uh, director of a Pixar Studios, uh, a 3D animation, you know? so he became very successful guy, you know, and I went back to the martial arts and I was lucky to become successful in the martial arts as well, you know. You're into martial arts at a young age, right? I start at five years, five years old, you know. That was, judo. what was that with judo? In Brazil, when I was yeah, when I was young in Brazil, it was not something that your mom's going to put you to train, you know. The most mm. jiu-jitsu school that exists at the time, if it exists, was uh, like a not very nice environment, you know. <laughs> was people that actually go there to learn how to fight and fight on the street. For a long time, jiu-jitsu was not looking at good eyes in Brazil. Right. Uh, and judo had like a better reputation, was it? Yes, it was a really bad. We, we, the car was a pit boys, you know, compared to the pit bull dogs. Mm. <laughs> so they compared us as well, the pit boys, you know, the bad guys. But was not, it, this was actually not on my time. But this was before me, there was that fame. You know, when I started training Jiu Jitsu, actually, later on, um, Jiu Jitsu was not as bad as when I was a kid, you know. Right, right. <laughs> interesting because i think i think our members now because jiu-jitsu is so well known and so huge i think everyone would just expect you're in brazil you train jiu-jitsu because that's where jiu-jitsu is from right but you know it's grown so quickly so rapidly over the last 20 25 years and really exploded i think you know we we talk a lot of now even when i started jiu-jitsu 20 years ago you know you had to drive for hours to find a blue belt you know they just didn't exist in the uk it was Braulio, Hodger, Victor, my instructor, my professor. Um, and th those were the only guys. Um, and so, but now, you know, jiu-jitsu, th it's everywhere. People are almost spoiled, if that's a good word, right? Like they, 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 they have jiu-jitsu straight away. Yeah. Belt, you know? 
that boy was hard to find the pictures of your opening, alone the videos. You know, today you go on the internet, you can find it, break down what they open it, do better to compete against you. You know, so mm -hmm. it's 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 good. It's it's an evolution, and I I'm I'm happy that I was part of this evolution. You know, and no no one I think even Master Carlos or anybody ever thought that will become that big of a business. You know, and we just have to still, you know, surf in the, the wave and make the sport grow, you know, and see how they're going to take us, you know. And, and uh, Gracie Baja West Chase just had their 10th year anniversary, right? Yes. How did that go? We opened in 2000. We opened in 2010. And actually, I did a podcast the other day for a guy. And I was mentioned, I, I moved right here because my mother-in-law and my father-in-law actually lives in Houston. My father-in-law worked for the federal government and he was the last, his last assignment and he was about to retire, he moved to Houston. And he really enjoyed because Texas is like, people welcome we really well. And um, he came up with the idea and then I went to talk to Master Carlos you know, about like a loan, you know, if you couldn't lend me some money to open a school or can find me uh, an investor because my wife was pregnant and my school in California was not that profitable because of very little schools, 2,000 square feet. And, um, you know, he said, you know, Houston is very nice. Texas is good. Go to Houston. I want us to see it. Go to Texas. So Draculino was already living here for like two years in Texas. And I think he moved in 2008 and or 2007 something like this i think it was 2008 and then i called him i said master you know uh, i have to to leave california i can't afford to live right here i don't have expectations to grow i'm going to open a little school so i moved to texas my father-in-law and my mother-in-law helped me to open this, this school i don't know one student i don't have one friend i never taught a seminar right here and also i was not a jiu-jitsu world champion so everybody say you're crazy, <laughs> but I believe in the system and I believe in my work effort, you know. People might be better than me on jiu-jitsu, but they're not better than me on uh, effort, you know. I will, I, I will train with you, you beat me, I will go train, 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 till I do better, I never give up, you know. And it was the same on the business. Everybody said, don't do it, don't do it. But I want to prove that I, I, I'm capable, that I move, and was like even past my expectations really fast. You know, in the first year we put 300 members. Wow. You know, so it was crazy. And I keep just hustling, find the right people to work by my side, you know, my wife, and, and we, we, we built this thing. We have a, a lot of students, you know, and the thing now, the machine works alone. I don't have to do much anymore. Right. You just, uh, what is it you choose to do around the academy nowadays? Is it you mainly just like to do the teaching or do you still do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff? What is it that you like to do? Uh, <clears throat> here's the thing that I, I, I try to explain to people. They call me all the time and ask, hey, can you give me the recipe, you know, so we can replicate right here and do the same. Uh, the recipe, I think, is this. I don't want to go behind the scene, you know. I want to be the main, you know. I want to be the showman. So the only way that I can prove this is if I show up for every competition class, if I show up for every class, you know. Of course, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm, I'm get tired, you know. Like, usually I work Monday to Wednesday. I teach other classes. And also, I don't do the office job anymore because I delegate the power to the other ones. But I check if they do the job, and then if I have any requests, I do. But my my, my main job at the school today is I'm the, I'm the professor, you know, I teach the class because I was right. able to put a system in place that runs by itself. I don't need to be there all the time. Yeah, behind the scenes, you know. You, uh, I've heard you still like to teach all the uh, kids classes as well. Or you like still like to teach a lot of the kids classes? Um, I like the little kids, three to six years old. Oh yeah. The reason. <laughs> It's number one, they, they're genuine, you know, they're just the kids. Mm -hmm. And I like to see the kid learn 
the discipline at a young age, you know? So I teach the kids class. And it's crazy because I think my school is the only, our school is the only one that has six black belts in a little kids class. <laughs> it's crazy. Wow. You know? <laughs> Most of the schools, they have one purple belt, teach the little kids, we have six. Because like, you know, today we have 43 black belts. Whoa, insane, wow. So sometimes you come to one class at night time is 20 on a mat. You know, wow. it's crazy. That's some deep, uh, that's some deep knowledge there, man. I mean, I, mean, I, yeah. I wonder whether, whether that kind of depth, I mean, obviously you've been doing this for a long time, but that depth and maintaining those uh, professors within your own school benefits your growth going forward, right? Because a lot of professors would leave, but obviously they're happy training with you. They want to be with you. And, you know, that just makes your school so unique. Yeah. He, he, I, I, I got to say, this is not mandatory. As a black belt, you're getting older. You have to actually respect the, the, the age, the, 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 you know, your, your physical abilities, you know. I'm not the best person to say this, but I think they look up to me because I train. Sometimes I do... 12 rounds on a day, <laughs> you know, a tough training. So I keep training with all the black belts, white belts, blue belts, and I make the instructors right here do the same. Like Pedro, he trains with everybody. You know, it's, it's part of the job. You got to train with the students. They have to have the same feelings that I have. When I was young, when I went to the, the Gracie Baja, you know, they, they put me to train with the tough guys. Why right here are going to put them to don't have this, you know? So I think you want to keep them motivated to see that every day I train and every day I get in better and they see my jiu-jitsu evolve. Because like today I have a jiu-jitsu, I have my, my jiu-jitsu is like updated. You know, I'm not like only old school. I know how to do the young, the new things as well because I keep learning from these guys. You know, Pedro, Bruno, Servando, all these guys that I have right here, I keep learning from them, you know. 100%. I've told this story before, um, Professor, but when uh, when I was awarded my black belt, Professor Victor, the only thing he said to me, apart from congratulations, was the only thing I ever ask of my black belts is to never turn a roll down. You know, he's the same mindset that you should always be training with everybody. You should never pick and choose your roles. You should be sharing your jiu-jitsu with everyone, right? Yeah. I, you know, like, if you come to my school today, I'm going to look at you, and the first thing I'm going to say is say the first one with me. Doesn't matter who you are. Can be Roger Grace. I'm gonna say the first one is me, you know, <laughs> because I wanna go fresh. So I wanna test myself, you know. <laughs> I'll make sure I remind you of that when we come visit. <laughs> you don't need to remind me, this is a rule. <laughs> you have to remind you have to remind yourself that you're gonna go the first one with me. I'm screwed. It'd be a pleasure. Pedro actually sometimes complains. I get you this. Pedro sometimes complain because he say. I'm too rough on the students because I beat them too much. But I don't. Do that. You guys yeah. do that? Yeah, yeah, we're back. We just lost you. Because no, I got you the school right here. Yeah. Oh, it's easier. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Let me put on a speaker. Right? Hello. Hello. Yeah, now I can hear you guys. I right, we just lost you as you were getting out of the car. You say yeah, that. Uh, Enough there. Sometimes too it's, rough with the students. Uh, look, we get here. Look. What's up, team? Nice. Wrestling yes. class. We never stop, you know. There's a competition yeah. class. Try this wrestling. You know? Nice. I don't do wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> so, go on. You were saying, Professor, that. Uh, um, Pedro says that you're a bit too rough with the students sometimes. Go on, explain what yes. you mean. It's not rough. I'm not tough. It's this. They come right here. If you come right here, you're a doctor, okay? I will train with you. Remind, remember that you're a doctor. You come right here, you're a fighter. I'm going to give you a welcome. because Not because I try to be uh, uh, cocky or anything, but I think it, it's this. You have to show to the students. You know, that you got to push them to be better than you. And the only way is by give them what they're looking for. They're looking, they come right here to improve. If I train with them, I don't beat them at the point they say, 
check reality and say, then I need to improve, they will not improve, you know? So it's fair to say that I'm rough because it's a, usually teachers doesn't do this. But I don't know if every teacher has the same uh, passion that I have and they want to see the students to see as much as I do, you know? So it's just, I think it's just a philosophy that I have. For sure. I mean, what's your other kind of philosophies around being a martial artist? Like, obviously, you've been doing martial arts since you were five years old. What, what does being a martial artist mean to you? Um, I think the martial arts brought, brought out for me was in life, everything is competition. You want to have a better job, you have to, be, have, to be, have, have to have a better knowledge than the other person that you compete. Otherwise, they're going to give the job to the other person. You want to be a world champion. You cannot train like everybody else. You have to do something the other ones don't do it so you can be better. So I keep this concept on this school right here that life is about competition. It's nothing wrong to lose, but don't think that when you lose, you did good because when you lose, you didn't go, do good. You lose, you did bad. So this concept that they have, you know, when you lose, you learn, no. When you lose, you understand that I can do better. You know, so I, I don't know. I just, I always have this idea. I always stick with my, you know, with my ideas and my philosophy and money, nothing will change. And I keep real, you know, like promotions in my school. I don't promote the student just because he paid the membership. His promotion also is not based on how much medals he won. Because I don't really care about the matters that he wants to promote them. But I care how much commitment and how much effort he put to go to the next level. You know what I mean? You can't help people that doesn't want to be helped. So if I just give the belt because they pay the membership and they attend the class, but they didn't learn, one day they're going to have the reality check for somebody else and they might going to be frustrated that I didn't give it to him the, the heads up, you know? 100%. I think we've got a responsibility to, to be honest about what it means, what hard work really means. You know, you know that building the business, being in jujitsu, it's sometimes not easy, man. And we, I think we have a responsibility to make sure that we stay true to, to what that means in terms of, you know, you've got, you've got to work hard if you want to be successful. Some people look from the outside perhaps and think it's easy. You know, like we said earlier, your school was formed a long time ago. It's a small school. You moved, you took risks. You worked hard. That's the only way to succeed. We're the same, you know. Opened up this school in lockdown. No one could train. Risked a lot, but we believed in it. We worked hard, harder than anyone else. And, you know, you get the rewards after that, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I think it's this. Uh, and I try to pass this to Pedro. Pedro, Pedro is a, a good example of this. Pedro, every time he goes to fight, you see how confident he is. It's because on a trainer, he doesn't matter who they put. Our idea is this, they trouble, not us. And why? Because he gonna, I guarantee any fight in his life will be bad, worse than the train that he has on a daily basis. Because he has to fight 10 on the same day, or that's just one, you know? So I don't just pass this to him, but the idea is he understand the concept since day one. The first day that he came out here, I don't even know him. My first friend with him, I look at him like he was Roger Gracie and I have to be Roger Gracie and I'll become famous. Why? Because I want him to understand is this, I push myself to the limit. You got to do the same, not just for competition, but as a teacher, as a father, as for everything, as a businessman, you know? So when I took the risk to open a large school, a lot of people say, you're crazy. You're going to go to that big. I say, go big or go home because I know what I do. I know what I'm capable of, you know? And it's, it's just, again, it's not that I'm special or anything, but I'm confident. And I think most, most people lack the confidence. You know, they already go to a business thinking, oh, you know, if I do okay, I, I'm, I'm fine. No, if I do okay, I'm not fine. You know, I'm, I'm here to do the best. I wanted to people reach out to me, not to be like me, but actually to be above me. Example, in that fashion, I worked right here for six years. He opened his school, he moves, you know, he leaves my, my, our school, he opened his own school. So he opened eight months ago during the lockdown pandemic. 
Calvary has 200 students. The reason, he see the way that we operate right here and then he see working, he replicates, you know? And I don't know, but like when you go to the big, big franchises like McDonald's, okay? If you go to Japan, they're gonna have teriyaki, Mac burger or something. Why? Because this in Japan they sell teriyaki, so McDonald's cannot lose that, you know, that face. So I, I think every area, even with the same product, Reci Baja, you have to extract the data from your students to be able to provide them what they need. And I do this really well. I have a lot of forms, a lot of things that I use right here to create data, to track my students' necessities. So I can provide them. Yeah, I've heard you on a, a couple of podcasts and uh, one of the big things I kind of took away was how much you operate your school as a business, which is something like we've um, done a lot here as well. Whereas there's a lot of schools, not necessarily Gracie Baja schools, but other schools uh, within our city and our country that don't really, that operate not really like a business. I wouldn't know how to describe well, they're it. Very, they're very yeah. kind of relaxed, a bit like jiu-jitsu used to be, you know, paying per session, no back office system. Like you say, don't track the students, don't really like understand their students. And I think they're, you know, they're living in the dark ages. I, I, you know, like when I say about the data, I, I, like the, the area that we have our school, okay? It's a lot of people that work in the office buildings and they have only six o'clock in the morning to train lunchtime. <clears throat> because they live far. So when they leave, the, they leave the house at five in the morning, they go to work. So they have five to seven to work out in some ways, or here, or on a normal gym, and they go to work. And then they have a lunch break. Some people take the lunch break, some people don't take the lunch break. And at nighttime, usually the people that are gonna come to your school is people that live around you, or people that doesn't have families, like, daughters kids you know uh wife because they already been out five since six o'clock in the morning if they do shit and go home at 10 they will not see the family okay so i was able to pull this data and i realized why people does not attend the morning class how they're going to come to the class train jujitsu and take a shower if i don't offer a shower so i should i i start to offer a shower and then i realized yeah but you know these guys have to leave the wet towel on the car all day, the car is male. So I start off with the towels. And then I realized now the kids male all day on a the car, they go home, their wife complain. I start to offer the laundry service. So Perfect. every single question that he might have, why he couldn't make the training, I eliminate. So how he not gonna make the training? Oh, I can't go because I have to take a shower. I can't go sweat to the to, to the work. I fix this problem. I, I can take my gear wash for you. You know, so I think you only get this if you get the data with the surveys to figure out what the needs of your student. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, interesting. It's great to hear you say that, Professor, because we've done exactly the same. We have a laundry service. We have lockers now. Exactly for the same reason. Even the timings of our classes are specific so that it gives enough people time to commute into the city, still be able to park and walk to the office. Even thinking at that level, thinking, right, what time do we put it on? It has to be 6.30 because they have to be in the office by eight. You know, we've got to do it right. You've got to think carefully about these things. Yeah, example, uh, it's, it's a very common in the United States right here. Gracie Bahia schools, not Gracie Bahia schools, but most of the schools, the, the lunch class is 11 a.m. I never understand why. And here's the thing, my area, I'm not in the suburbs, I'm on a city. So some other schools is in the suburbs. The suburbs, the people, my, they don't have to drive to the city or they work from home or they own their own business or whatever. So they 11 o'clock work at that, right? He doesn't work, so I have to change. So now we have a class actually 12 and it's back. Right, yeah. That's when we so, run. I'll, I'll this is the, well, right? I, I don't want to say that I do different than the odd ones, but things that I worry that I don't know if the odd ones, all of them worry, you know? Well, you, you clearly think deeply about the decisions that you make. And I think that's, that's one of the key markers of someone who's successful. You, 
you don't just accept the norm, you, you question it and you think carefully about the decisions you're making and that's how you build a successful business, I think. That, yeah. <laughs> Professor, I wonder, um, someone who's kind of been around Gracie Baja since its kind of origins, um, from like the behind the scenes stuff the students don't usually see, um, like the SCP, the um, ICP and things like that. Is there anything in those kind of things that you would change if you were in charge? No. No, but I don't say that because the, because of Gracie Bible who listen, it's not, I, I'm saying this, this is the truth because actually I, I did the podcast that I did the other day, I was not a good leader. I was not a good leader. And I learned from my own mistakes that I couldn't cut if I follow the ICPs and everything that I did since the beginning. But a lot of things that was right there, I wanted, I, I was not understanding and take me years to and become more mature to understand a lot of things that I have right there. So when it becomes your business, like your students, they're not your friends, okay? They're your clients. You're right there. Your job is to provide the best service. Because in the end, we offer the service. Okay? We we don't offer, we, what we sell is not this. Uh, come right here to be buy your pass for a brotherhood. It's not this. We don't sell the brotherhood. We sell the service. And the brotherhood is created by the atmosphere that you have inside your business. And I think people kind of misunderstood this. Because they, some, I don't want to say everybody, but a lot of people treat jiu-jitsu as a cult. Example, I'm a black belt and then you purple belt. So you always ha have to get the worst side just because you're purple and I'm black. I have to mop the mats, you mop because you're purple, I'm black, I don't do it. So this is something that I think goes to the cult. It's not a cult, you know? Like I mop the mats as much as everybody else mop the mats on a competition class because the competition class, we are competitors. That's why we're there. So I do one day, John do one day, Pedro do one day, Bruno do another day, Seth do another day. When we come to the business, I'm the owner. I pay someone to clean the school. I don't clean because it's a business. I pay someone. So people have to separate the business and the passion in order to succeed. And most of the school owners of Jiu-Jitsu in general, they are the program director, their the wife also is the coach. And, you know, it's great. I did this in the beginning. My wife did it in the beginning because we don't have a lot of uh, financial resources. We need to do it. But once we start to get on the feet, the first thing I did is fulfill that spaces with actually employers. They can't do it. So you, I delegate the work. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear because it's kind of similar lines. Yeah, all, yeah. exactly that. Yeah. I mean, you've got to scale out and you, you're right. You've got to separate it. I think I found I'm very, very new to this, but the culture, you say the atmosphere, you know, the word I would use perhaps is culture. That comes from us. The way we, we expect people to be with each other here, respectful, you know, the team and everything else creates the culture that everyone else lives by, you know, and we don't want yeah. people to break that culture up. Um, but I've, I've learned some lessons already about trying to be, uh, maybe I haven't done very well at separating out being their friend and being, you know, their jujitsu provider as well. Because I found the more I give to people, sometimes they, the more they take. And there's only usually, so usually the people that makes you frustrate more is the ones that you have under your wing, you know, because they tend to believe that what you do as a favor is an obligation. And when you cannot do it, you're not the same person anymore. Now you're business, you know what I mean? Right. <clears throat> so I know how to draw this line really well. You know, like, I don't, that's me, you know, I, I, I don't drink, I don't drink, but you're never gonna see me to invite a group of students, let's go drink a beer. That's not what I sell. I, you're gonna see me, let's go, drink a protein shake, let's go eat the acai bowl, because even though there's nothing wrong with the drink, but I don't go drink 
It's like you don't go party with your mom. Your mom gonna see you drink and do a crazy things, you know, even though you love your mom. With your mom, you wanna go, go have a brunch. You wanna go have a lunch. You don't wanna go to a nightclub with your mom. You know what I mean? No, definitely not. So definitely I think not people, people don't understand that they start to bring like particular problems into this and cause the drama. I don't have a lot of drama right here because I'm very neutral. I'm the professor. Like when you see Master Carlos, you, you, he's a, your idol, but you have that, that block because you see, you look at him like he's a lawyer, you know, like he's a, like a king, you know, like, oh my God, let me get close to this guy just to get the energy. But you don't tell, you don't go to Master Carlos and say, Master Carlos, I fight with my wife, yes. We have a big fight yesterday. You know, that, that's, you know, like you look at him in a different way. So I try to make that barrier where my students look at me only to talk about good things, you know? Yeah, that's good advice. Thank you. Good advice, man. Professor, what was it like in those early days when Prof um, Professor Fatoza and uh, Master Carlos came over? What, what was training like back in those early days? Uh, actually, I, I, moved, I moved first to the United States before they moved. I moved in 2003. And I think they moved in 2005 or 2006. So it was Professor Marcio, Professor Andre, that actually runs the IBJJF, uh, Professor Arroz. I don't know if you guys know Professor Arroz. No. Uh, he's in Chicago today. And Kira Gracie was as well. And they opened a school with some partners. And then the, 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 the partnership for some reason didn't work really well, you know, and then they moved to another location. That's when I start to go more often. And it was like crazy to see a very little space in short time become like a huge, a lot of people training. So was, I have to say was not the toughest room but at the time, little by little, more people start to move to the United States. And I remember Babalu was training there, and then Professor Flavio Almeida came, and then Professor Dungey, Professor Gigantin, and then actually the room starts to become really tough. You know, the, the wall becomes really wall, high to climb, you know. And it was crazy because on the same little room, they operate Gracie Barra, Gracie Barra uh, gear, like where? Yep. Mark Antonio, Pew Pew, they have a little room in the back full of boxes. You ask for a gear, he go check on the boxes and give you the gear, you know. It was the first Gracie Bar gears ever. So it was pretty amazing to see that room of actually friends that treat as a hobby. They have these amazing ideas and put things together. Professor Flav used to teach intro class to white belts. You can think about that. He's doing squats, jumping jacks three, four times a day. And it was just crazy to participate in this. And today we all succeed, we're all doing well. You know, all these people that actually was there on that room that I've related, they all succeed. So it was, it was amazing. The, the training was, it was good. Mm. Brother, what do you think makes Gracie Baja different from a lot of other uh, Jiu Jitsu affiliations these days? Master Carlos is always being well as the visionary. Okay. So he has a vision for things and he sticks with his principles. So I think what makes the Gracie Barra different than the odd ones is because what they start to doing right now, Master Carlos has been doing since 2005. This organization, this curriculum, these uniforms, everything. And now, because at that time, everybody criticized. Oh, Jiu-Jitsu to become a McDonald's. Oh, this doesn't work. So it's like you take a lion and you want to bring a lion to your house. It doesn't work like this. You have to take time to the lion understand they're not in a jungle anymore. You can pet the lion, you know? You can't pet the lion in the jungle. You're going to bite your hand off. You know? So I think what's more the idea that people didn't understand that jiu-jitsu is not just a hobby anymore. We can turn this to a business. And I think Gracie Bar is 10 years ahead of all the other associations, you know? That's right, I think. Professor Pedro Coelho in Portugal said the exact same thing, like 10 years 
ahead of everyone. I mean, I remember, I remember clearly being on the mat with uh, Professor Victor talking about how jiu-jitsu needed to change, you know, and, and they, they became more serious about, you know, to, to the to the coaches and the, the instructors. Like, we had to be more professional around jiu-jitsu. The service we were offered, we should be proud of it, that it was worth the money people were paying for it. Because I think a lot of people felt awkward because we started off just paying five pounds, five dollars for a class. You let your friends train for free. It's okay. And then everyone felt a little bit awkward asking for the money that actually is worth it. And if you break down jujitsu, it's one of the cheapest things you can pay for, man. It's crazy. Like eight pound a class. It's like for a professor to teach you how to defend yourself and your family and keep fit and have a community for, for eight pounds, ten dollars. It's, it's not cheap. So it's just like you mentioned about stress or uh, Victor. So I remember, I remember this just to see how it's hard to, to take, take the lion and say, lion, listen, you don't need to bite everybody. You can be a lion and at the same time, you can be a pet. You know, that's what's actually, if you want to describe something better will be this, you know, we want to make a lion, a lion and at the same time, a pet. So at that time, I remember Professor Victor and Professor Browder they used to have sponsorships yep. and of uh, uniforms. And they was making, I don't go to say a lot of money, but they was making money when jiu-jitsu was not a, something that you believe you can make money. At that time, if I'm not wrong, was it Storm? Storm, yeah, it was. Storm Gage, yeah. Victor and, and, and I think it was Keiko before. So what happened was, they don't want to give up the sponsorships because they believe, you know, Gracie Bar is great, but Gracie Bar is my hobby. Why are you going to give up something that pay my bills? And with the time pass, either Vic, Vic, Professor Victor and Professor Braulio, they embrace the idea of the uniform more than everybody else because they see the opportunity that that door is open to bring way more business for your business because sponsorships i'm not going to say it's bad but it's only when you on your prime time if tomorrow you broke your leg you can't compete anymore they don't remember who you are i can make a list of 20 names of world champions right here that you're going to say i have no idea who is this guy you know what i mean so you have to be smart first so Braulio and victor they embrace and that's why today they become so you know, business powerful guys because they they make the choice in the right time. Yeah, and they're great uh, leaders as well. You know, we're very lucky to have those guys. Gracie Barr lost a lot of her black belts, old old school guys. A lot of people left, and at that time, because it was like a shock for them. But I believe today they I don't want to say all, but a lot of these guys regret because the Gracie Barr could have opened more doors and actually. They open the doors on their own, you know. Right, Professor. How did um, obviously it was? Uh, we spoke to Professor Pedro um, a couple of weeks back, and he told us, uh, you know, definitely go speak to to yourself. Um, how was it that you first met or heard, heard of um, Professor Pedro? Uh, look how how fun is the things. I I always be into the competition like crazy, you know. I always use the word pohada right here non-stop because that's how we been raised back home in Belo Horizonte. All the trainers are pohada. So actually Pedro was not something that I planned or anything. Uh, I have a guy from Brazil that was here with me. His name is Gabriel. He's one of the, today he's a brown belt at uh, Gracie Barra in Belo Horizonte today. And Gabriel, I have a mutual friends and Gabriel actually speak English. So I have a project that I do is this, I bring two or three guys from Brazil, blue or purple belts, and I host them right here for three months. I offer a place to live and a transportation, you know? So I have place to live, transportation, I, and, and I give them food. Like I give allowance so that they can use to eat, but they have no salary and they don't work for me. My goal is to train them to become a coaches. Uh, actually, also, 
I will help them to compete in every tournament that they can be the next big name. And if they do well, if they have something to do with the philosophy that we have right here, if they're on time, if they're good people, and I see a potential of the person, eventually I, I offer them to be the sponsor and I hire them as a P1 athletes to compete for my school. So I have this project right here. So I have several people that came before, you know, that they was really tough, black belts, brown belts, but they don't have what I need, what I'm looking for the person. Doesn't matter if you're just a champion, if you don't have good character, you don't have a good effort to work, if you're not nice with the other ones, it's not what I'm, I'm looking for. In the end, I want something that I will help that person to succeed, but the person gonna help me as well. So Gabriel was a perfect guy, tough as hell, super tough, champion as well. And he said, why? My grandma, my grandpa, they old, they miss me. I need to go back home. And I got really upset. Say, man, after all this time, five months right here, now everybody likes you, you're going to go home. Say, I'm sorry, man, I got to, I have to go. I say, can you suggest me someone? So he was on a previous uh, project as well, Gabriel. He's from Belo Horizonte. The, the previous project, they take people from everywhere. But Gabriel was one that the trains over there. So he said, I know some people in a project that they want to move to the United States. I say, refer me someone, tell to contact me. So I don't even know Pedro. I have no idea if he's tough or not. I have no clue. So the guy gave me the number. I contact, Pedro contact me. I said, bro, talk to Felipe if he's okay. You know, I pay your ticket. It's three months. You're going to have to compete. You're going to have to learn English. And you're going to have to be a coach right here with me, help me on the class. And if I like you, I'm going to offer you a job. So he ended up coming right here, Purple Bell. And one week before he came, I saw his videos. And I saw, man, this kid is good on guillotine. He should meet everybody on guillotine. He arrives on Saturday. On Sunday, I came right here. I trained with him for 30 minutes, kick him nonstop. And then I say, you pass on the test, you're tough. <laughs> And everything starts right there. I have no clue who he, he, who he was or how much potential he can get. I have was just pure, I'm not going to say lucky, but was like he, he needs to find someone that believes in him and bring him to America. And I was looking for somebody that I can't believe that can be my helper over here. And it works well, and then the rest is the rest. Have you have you always had a really strong competition team at Gracie Baja West Chase? How how did that develop? Always, always, because like I say, everything is about competition. You know, so I always have not as strong as right now. Is super strong. Right now, I have not just Pedro, but I have like I have a guy right here named Douglas. He's the number one on IBJJF, you know, ranking purple belt. We have Professor Bruno also, he's amazing, tough, you know, same level of Bruno, Pedro, but he's 21 years old. Brazilian, two times Brazilian national champion. So we have a several tough kids right here, you know. I have a bunch of Cuban wrestlers that train right here with us. There wasn't a third grappling coach, they're all tough, you know. We, we, now we have a very strong team. But was not always that strong, but I always was the main guy pushing the team, you know, I never stopped. So was it just kind of consistency and that always having like a competition class, always going training hard? So it was that that kind of made that eventually developed it into the crescendo where it is now? Yes, I always train with the students and I always show up for every competition training and I always be the one that trained more than everybody. Not right now, because now I'm in a different phase of my life, you know, I'm, you know but I still train a lot. But like this month, I'm moving, I'm doing all this stuff. I don't train as much because I have other things on my head. But usually, you can ask this to Pedro. I'm always on the mats and I always train in a competition training. Like, I want to kill them because, again, I want to show them that, you know, pushing yourself to the limit, you're going to succeed. If you settle for less than you deserve, you're not going to succeed, you know? Is that a philosophy you try and instill in all of your students or just the competition team? Uh, we have a fundamentals program. 
you have a you know advanced program. The intensity of the class of uh, fundamentals and uh, advanced class is not as much as the competition class. It's a balance. We, an advanced class I have lawyers, doctors, executive people that can get black eyes or anything. So I try my best to pass to them that they can be tough as well and they can enjoy the other group. But I try to make a balance where only I'm going to say 5% of my school's competition. 95 is not. Hmm. But the non-competition, I try to put on their mind, the competition mind. They just don't do the competition, you know? Right. To keep the mindset, but without the, without the added chances of getting black eyes and things like that. Yes. Happens sometimes, but try to avoid. <laughs> Professor, I'd love to hear if you, I know you said you worked as a bouncer. Uh, was there any nights where you had to use a lot of your jiu-jitsu as a bouncer? Uh, about it, I don't even want to go into this. I was not For legal I reasons like to answer that question. I was not. I was. I don't. I don't know if I could use that word, but I was not the nicest guy in the world. Okay, I was a troublemaker. I like it. I always have the fighter instinct in me, and sometimes when I say that I'm a better person now because I know actually emotion anymore and before I did so my years of bouncer I use a lot of jiu-jitsu you know I use a lot of real neck jokes guillotines and I'm rocks you know but uh, sometimes it was excessive unnecessary but I was using jiu-jitsu on my bounce as a, as a bouncer skills you know well, well I'm sure your uh, customers were happier to be uh, excessively choked than excessively punched in the face, so. <laughs> yeah, I become the, at that time, the club was a very famous club in, in Orange County, California. So a lot of celebrity goes in the club and I All become right. the, the main, not, not the, the manager, but I was one, the guy that does the roaming and they check the ideas of some people, you know? So I was able to refer eight Brazilian black belt guys. So it was nine total black belts on a club. Wow. It was not a very nice place to become to get a fight, you know? <laughs> no trouble in that black place. Brazilian guys ready to defend, you know? Brilliant. Amazing. Brilliant. You didn't have an Ashton Kutcher show up, did you? Try to tell you about his jiu-jitsu? Who? Ashton Kutcher? <laughs> no, no. He never, yeah. So it was more like uh, baseball players, football players. Because oh, I think yeah. you're you already know. Fantastic, man. Great to talk to you. Yeah, we'll need to wrap this up soon, Professor. We've got some uh, classes. Got a few more kind of questions for you, though. Um, I know you, I listened to um, some of your podcasts, as, as you said, the one that came out recently as well. And, you know, your school has around 750 students, right? Yeah. How, how is it you find managing such a such a large kind of membership base? Um, I have two program directors, okay? Wow. One person only responsible to answer emails uh, and sell memberships. The other person is in charge to best do delinquents, cancellations, freezes, and respond leads. So, the, like I say, you know, the system works really well. And these people that work for us right here, they've been with me for nine years, 10 years, you know? So they actually are a part of the system. And I create some, because like the biggest challenge is that everybody's focus in how many students you can sign up. A month. Everybody worry about the leads and how many students you can sign up in a month, which for me is the biggest mistake. If you ask me today how many students we sign up this month, I'm going to say, I don't know. But if you ask me, you guys doing well, I'm going to say, yes, we're doing well. Because it's business, right? So if I sign up 100 people a day, a month, and I make $10,000, if I sign up five and I make $20,000, which one is better? 
Five. Five. Less headache and more money. Correct. So how we manage the system right here is this. I think not just, uh, I think the, the system, the regular system fails in retention. Retention is, what makes a restaurant as good is how many people come back to eat your food again. Right. You know what I mean? So this is, I think, is something that people do all the time. So I have coaches right here. They're responsible for the new students. So I have the program director responsible for the intro class student. So on, after he become a student, I have another coach assessor to take care of that person for two weeks. Example, you come to do your intro class. I, I go to school today. I have to do hipscapes. First day, nobody knows how to do hipscape, right? So you put one coach right there on the first class teaching the hipscape. And the guy do the hipscape, they did the break fall, they do everything. On the end of the class, the guy sign up, become a student. Next day he show up, nobody's with him. Nobody greet him by the name. And nobody say, hey, John, I'm right here waiting for you to help in your warm up because I know you didn't learn a warm up on the first day. So usually people just put him in a class because now I signed him up, I got his money. So he feels idiot that because he can't even do a hip skate. And he try maybe the next day he will miss because say, man, I won't go because I can't even do the exercise. So when he come back, he might feel idiot again because nobody gave him attention and he quit. After one, two months, he quit. So your retention, you sign up to any, but you lost this guy really fast. So you sign up a hundred a day, a month, but you lost a hundred, so you never grew. That's right. the protection people do. Yeah. So I create a developer system where I track the student for two weeks to the coach say, no, he's good to go. He can go his own now. And every day that he get here, the guy say, hey, John, how are you? I'm glad you're back. Sometimes my coach send a message, John, I just want to let you know the last two weeks he did awesome and you improve so well in Jiu-Jitsu and it helps a lot. The guy feels special and no one does this because they think I got this money. You know right. what I mean? Amazing. Yeah, so that's... I think that makes us big is because we have less cancellations that sign up. And I'm more focused on a retention than actually the yeah. sign up. Usually the signups, okay? Every school do some kind of deal that you don't make that much money on a sign up. You're gonna make the money on an ongoing monthly to revenue, right? I Right here, I do the opposite. You know what I mean? I rather to get the students that they already have make them spend more money, offer to them all the ways to spend the money where that student stand the value for me, $100, value 200. Then actually I have to try to find the student sign up for nothing and then he cancel, you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Yep. And is that with your kind of premium membership, I suppose, or your laundry or like gym? How, how do you monitor? The laundry, I don't have capability to do for a large amount of people okay because we're doing house we have washer and dryers inside the school i have a company that come like none of my instructors clean the mats they're not their jobs the reason none of my program directors clean the school they're not a cleaning people cleaning people cost one third of the price of the program director and one third of the price of the instructor, correct? Right. So let's say my program director have to work eight hours a day. Of this eight hours that I pay him, three hours he has to clean the school. He only have five hours to do the rest of his job. You know, so I neutralize, I lost, I don't know, maybe 30% of his time that I pay him to do something that is not so productive to bring income to my school. So I hire a company now that the lady comes out here, one thirty, cleans the school, one thirty to four. And then we open at 4.30 and 
nine o'clock, they come back and clean from nine thirty to twelve, and next day six in the morning have a class. Wow, it's mm -hmm. non-stop. For so before uh, we let you go, I was wondering what has been the best advice you've received in jiu-jitsu, and what advice do you give to your new beginning students now? The best advice is uh, number one is believe in yourself. You know, I think Master Carlos said this to me a long time ago, on his own way. You know, but he kind of said, "You're good on this. I don't understand why." You're doing a bouncer work if you're so good in jiu-jitsu. So that's what's like believe in yourself. You doubt it, you know? And it's a coincidence because when I opened my first school, one month before I opened the doors, I find out Helion Gracie, actually Master Carlos brother, was opening a school in the same street one mile from me. <laughs> Every friend of mine called me and said, rest in peace, brother, the biggest mistake of your life. The grace is going to screw you over. And it's funny because that's who don't exist anymore. And we're still growing. You know what I mean? He shut the doors. You know, and actually was Master Hilton on the beginning. And then later he put somebody else to teach. But it's not because I'm better. Because I believe in myself more than they believe in themselves. And I was able to succeed. You know, so I think uh, my advice for people is number one, be organized. Number two, Believe in yourself. And number three, never cease to find research to improve because the involvement is on a daily basis. Every day you learn something new, you know? And when you want to be on this very competitive business, if not willing to put yourself out there to learn, you will succeed. Sure. Amazing. Great advice, man. Thank you. Well, um, before you go, Professor, you know, Professor Pedro recommended that we speak to you. Uh, is there anyone else in the Gracie Baja community, well known or not known at all, uh, that you think we should get, reach out to and speak to? Man, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bunch of uh, I mean, amazing people at Gracie Baja, you know. But I think every uh, person having unique uh things that they can share and inspire the other ones so i know he's busy but homelo but how he has some idea or things that most people don't have which is not money is a conquer you have to be able to conquer more than the other one. so he has a very unique story and it's nice and the odd one that i recommend you guys to share his story is tusa about professor lenka because they all moved to here, living on the floor of my house because I was the first one. So they sleep on the floor. Wow. See all these guys today, not just financially, but actually as a champions, you know. So people have to understand this new generation today. They kind of spoil. They want to, you know, do a massage, recovery drink, personal trainer for this, guy to stretch. Uh, you know, cupping, and they sometimes they don't succeed because they're too worried about this. Homo, Lutusa, myself, and many other ones, we eat Twix and, and Coke before the tournament, and we also succeed. The diet was Twix and Coke. And before you get a pyramid, you puke on the way because you're too nervous, you know? Many times we all puke or have some kind of diarrhea, because of the butterflies, you know? So people have to leave the technology a little bit away and be more authentic because the champions, you know, are not born or made, you know? But with all these new things that people do, they take away the shit, you know? For sure, well, thank you for the recommendation. We'll reach out to Homolo about Conquering and Professor Tusa. And um, thank you so much for your time, Professor. I know you're really busy. Delay, man, but... You know, I have uh, issues and, and and I'm glad I was able to make it. And, um, you know, let me know when you guys put the podcast out so I can share with the students here. For sure. We hope to meet you in person as well one day, forever out in America. For sure. We'll show up the train and uh, we'll get those rolls in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Bye. Cheers, Professor.